Comic books are a natural jumping off point for really theatrical material. The frames have to tell the story. Basically the same process as making a movie. The comic book genre makes them a ton of money. Hollywood needs big movies to take advantage of their big technology. See that? Hundred million dollar movie right there in my hand. I think there's a period of time where a lot of people look down on comic books. I was rejected by every studio in Hollywood. But a lot of them were misfires. I had no idea what I was in for. It was brutal. I was brought up on Superman. You didn't make a fool of Superman. That was a monster hit. That was just sensational. Comics are sort of modern fairy tales that way. What's interesting is that there are films out there that are being made based on comics that nobody knows are, are comics. It's such a visual medium. The images are there. Visually and uh, creatively, it's an absolute juggernaut. On the set of a new summer blockbuster, an unusual Hollywood hero has all the Hollywood trappings. Cutting edge technology, an A-list director, and star power bringing the imagination to life. Red Bean, stop! Hellboy first hit the big screen in 2004, emerging from the shadows of an obscure comic book to become a surprise box office smash. Four years later, the big budget sequel is a sign of the times. Comic books today are the most important talent pool for movies. the appeal in this comic book world. I mean, it's such a, they all have such a dark underbelly, but they're so huge and they're beautiful stories. There is a high degree of absurdity that comes from pulps and comics that is just naturally assumed as normal. It's fundamentally, they're a, a visual medium. You know, the frames that make up the progression of comic book storytelling are the same as the frames that make up the progression of movie storytelling. I think there's still a Hollywood perception of what a superhero film is supposed to be. But people now realize you can treat the material in a way that isn't just geared towards little kids. Seeking imagination, inspiration, and big box office, producers started turning to comic books more than any other source. Dozens of adapted titles have been taking over theaters, with many more in some stage of production or development. I never imagined years ago that these characters would have the life that they have now on film. It's a testament to how well made the superhero films of the past eight years have been, in the most cases, that actors of the quality of Robert Downey Jr. Um, are willing to even uh, come in and consider those roles. You have someone like Edward Norton in the same way for The Incredible Home. Comic book stories make great movies because it really starts with character. I mean, any great movie starts with character, and the comic books tend to have so much legend behind them. Today, Hollywood draws those legends and characters from an expansive world of comic book material. Thanks to advances in filmmaking technology, superhero stories are in play like never before. But the cutting edge is also about sophisticated content. And Hollywood has turned toward graphic novels, book-length comics, which use panel art to tell stories aimed at a grown-up audience. These pictures and words sequentially telling a story. And the way that that is now working back and forth in movies appears to be more serious. And so people take it more seriously. And then it turns out there are all these people, not just in comics, not just doing superheroes, that uh, have all this 
imagination. They don't have to be about superheroes and explosions and fights and action. It's an art form that can be used to illuminate the little things in life that most people overlook. There's a lot of heat on the industry now. It's the joke among us cartoonists is that we're the research and development wing of Hollywood. This is like top grossing, huge, world beating stuff. This trend has been building for years as many of Hollywood's biggest stars have leapt into comics. A-listers and Oscar winners are now commonly donning capes and cowls to star in comic book fair. It's that feeling of being lonely, being outside, and it's sort of the fantasy that if people push you too hard, you've got this thing that's gonna rise up out of you and defend you. When I was a kid, I loved comic books and loved to play and, you know, dress up like superheroes and, and that sort of thing. So this is probably an extension of that as well. I grew up with Marvel Comics around the house, but I never thought that I would be in a kind of action movie based on that. I think it just speaks to a very kind of American idea of what's possible. Hollywood blossomed in the 1930s as talking pictures ushered in the golden age of cinema. While talkies were just starting to take their place in popular entertainment, comics were already an established part of growing up. Oh, we began in the newspapers. We were hot on newspapers in those days. And we looked forward to the newspapers on Sunday. And you went from that to the comic books. You just couldn't wait till the next one came out and you had 10 cents or a quarter or whatever it was. And uh, it was that fantasy. It was that little escape you... You went into every page you couldn't wait to turn and look at that next square. Superheroes led the way during this golden age of comics, battling evil with a host of peculiar powers. Most influential of all was the founding of the world that came to be known as DC Comics, headlined by Superman, an indomitable hero from the planet Krypton, and Batman, a dark vigilante detective who fought crime by night, seeking to avenge his parents' murder. These two heroes would form the backbone of comic books' claim on American pop culture into the next millennium. It's a matter of the dream man, you know, the Superman. You know, we've always had those from probably the time that man first learned to draw on the walls of caves. This is our heroic literature. This is our story of heroes uh, rescuing damsels in distress and fighting monsters. Comics are sort of modern fairy tales that way, or modern fables that tell about good and evil and the, the struggle for right and wrong. Like comic strips and books themselves, the first big screen adaptations were packaged in serialized form, with chapters released in regular installments, each chapter climaxing in an addictive cliffhanger ending. When I was a kid, serials were, were Saturday matinee musts. And I probably remember seeing dozens and dozens of serials, including Black Hawk, Superman, Batman, Spy Smasher, Captain America, Congo Bill, The Vigilante. They were cheap. That was the whole point. A lot of car chases, there were a lot of punches thrown and people jumping over tables, and not a whole heck of a lot more. Studios produced comic book serials at a rapid-fire pace during the 40s, but they were just considered pulp entertainment, a warm-up act shown before feature attractions. I think there's a period of time where a lot of people look down on comic books. I, I think that you either got it as visceral literature or you didn't. From the simplicity of serials, Hollywood now lavishes comic books with big time attention. The comic book genre makes them a ton of money. There's huge, there's huge built-in fan base in comic books. Every year, the comic book industry holds dozens of conventions around the nation. The biggest of them all are the Comic-Con events in New York and San Diego. These showcase conventions have become annual rites of passage for movie studios to start hyping their latest blockbusters. In 2007, Iron Man was unveiled by director Jon Favreau. We finished filming and uh, it went great. Uh, we're, wrap, we're coming out May 2nd. It's unbelievable, it really is. No, there's no way on earth that I would have suspected years ago that this would happen. Now, who knew that all along? The geeks and the kids that were reading them through the years. If you do these characters right, they can all be a success if they're, if they're done with a certain amount of reverence to where they came from. Most movies, you really have to cultivate a fan base through the marketing 
And I think with, with comic book movies, part of your branding has been done already. There's such geek cred now that, that that drives, you know, we want to satisfy that core geek audience. Catering to the voice of fans at Comic-Con and beyond has become a prime directive in Hollywood. This devoted, protective audience can make or break a film. The fans are very, very serious about their characters, and pressure is put on you by the fans to live up to their expectations. Those fans are pretty hardcore. The characters mean something to them personally, and um, they also like seeing what, you know, they love what we do well, and they like seeing what's done badly. I think it's become too significant for Hollywood, actually. I think that it's kind of taken away some of the spirit of Comic-Con. I, I think that some of the purity of the giant nerd fest that it was, is it's now a giant merchandising and focus group opportunity for Hollywood. To some extent, it's a good thing for the audience, right, that Hollywood really wants to please them. Um, but I think, it, to some extent, it's harder. The pressure of pleasing this passionate fan base is a welcome problem. There was a time when comic books and comic book movies simply had to fight for survival. In the 50s, during the uh, Red Scare era, there really was an assassination attempt out on a company called EC Comics, publishing horror comics. Actually, in retrospect, some of the best comics being done in their day, for sure. And um, there was this unbelievably fatuous belief that comic books made children into juvenile delinquents. Spurred by Senator Estes Kefauver, Capitol Hill investigated comics. A Senate commission relied primarily on the research of a Brooklyn psychiatrist, Dr. Frederick Wortham. He wrote a book called The Seduction of the Innocent, in which he claimed that comic books were responsible for virtually every ill in the world. He claimed kids were jumping out of windows like Superman. And apparently they found one kid who did it. And boy, that's all they needed. They went nuts with that story. He had all these really crazy things going in about uh, the homosexual relationship implied between Batman and Robin, the violent material and, you know, the, the lurid quality of the comic books that, uh, you know, America's youth were reading in the 1950s. It was a witch hunt. There were comic book burnings held in towns that were too reminiscent of Berlin around 1936. Because of the hue and cry caused by worth known as the Comics Code. It governed the language and storylines of comic books, but in Hollywood, the damage was done. Studios shunned comics as a source of new material. Because of the code, they, they shook everybody up. They didn't go near comics, you know? The Adventures of Superman. Only the wholesomeness of DC's clean-cut classic thrived in the late 50s, with George Reeves playing the Man of Steel on TV. And so, boys and girls, be super citizens and have a super future by saving regularly with United States saving stamps at school. Movie serials were a dying breed. The boom times for comic adaptations were a distant memory by the late 50s. But times, they were a-changin'. In the 60s, comic books evolved with the rebellious tide of a new era. Mainstream comics found an audience for alienated, disenfranchised young heroes. But some of the most important work was underground. In the late 60s, a lot of these underground comic books came about. They were against anything that was status quo, and obviously there was a lot of drug and psychedelic references and things like that. In a way, they represented more of an individual voice in comic books. This was stuff that was speaking to their own generation. You know, it spoke of stuff they cared about. I think it's a really important virus in society to have, you know, fringe people making powerful statements. Then there was like a revival come around the 60s. Comics started catching on again. Movie studios only produced a few comic book movies during the 60s each a distinct departure from the genre's mainstream traditions. In 1966, Batman went from a dark knight to a campy crime fighter. Adam West and Burt Ward starred in a new spin of over a million dollars. Jam-packed with dry humor, low-tech effects, and a cast of celebrity villains, Batman the movie barely registered at the box office. Most of us that grew up in comics knew Batman as an entirely different character, you know, and we, and we felt that that thing was actually a black mark on our history. Didn't he battle a plastic shark or something in that? Like, he's, I love that scene. Burt Ward wrote an uh, autobiography about Batman. Basically, it was like one big orgy or something for Batman and Robin, so I guess that did reflect the 60s. One comic steamed up the screen. In 1968, 
director Roger Vadim's adaptation of a French title, Barbarella. Jane Fonda, his wife, starred as the sexy interstellar heroine in a series of skimpy spacesuits. Barbarella is essentially like a sex film and a funny film, but uh, it, it's more about sexuality, it's more about fashion, it's more about French pop art uh, aesthetic and Jane Fonda. And I think it was kind of ahead of its time, though, in that way. I didn't know it at the time. As the decade turned, the envelope was pushed even further by a naughty animated cat. What's happening, man? Fritz the Cat was the brainchild of underground comic artist R. Crumb. It was adapted for the screen by a young animator from New York named Ralph Bakshi. Bakshi honed his voice drawing TV cartoons like Heckle and Jekyll and Mighty Mouse. Fritz the Cat was his first feature. Fritz the Cat is about this sort of hobo cat, this like no good, flea bitten, uh, you know, Greenwich Village stereotype, this beatnik, he sleeps in a garbage can, you know, this kind of thing, just wants all the girls and drugs. And it's just, it's funny, I mean. It's significant and important because all the cartoons were done by Disney up to that point. I mean, it was all Snow White and all the rest of it. This was, this was uh, social commentary. Fritz the Cat was also Rated X. I'm getting to the truth, I think, yes. Oh, yes. Mm, so it's getting all very clear now. It was unheard of. They're partying. You know, we have sex, we have drugs, we have parties. It got kind of known as this pornographic uh, film. It wasn't really that. It was more that it was dark vision of the 70s, this sort of revolutionary Fritz the Cat who is causing riots and, and trying to start a revolution. And at the end of the movie, he says, oh, forget it, I'm going to go have sex again. It's, you get over here, and you get down there like that. So there was, it was a very cynical movie in that way. In 1972, a comic book movie that was literally an adult film was clearly ahead of its time. But these days, it's common to see movies with mature content inspired by comic books. What's interesting is that there are films out there that are being made based on comics that nobody knows are, are comics. Action! <laughs> Ripped from the pages of long-form graphic novels, these adaptations look just like movies developed from traditional novels, plays, or works of nonfiction. And they receive just as much artistic respect. History of Violence earned an Oscar nomination for its screenplay. What's wrong, baby? History of Violence. Nobody would know that was a graphic novel. And I think you just have directors that like that material and view it like a, just another ver you know kind of literature. Road of Paradition surprises a lot of people when you tell them. Um, it's just a form of storytelling, and there's a lot of great storytelling being told out of this you know, superhero genre now. One of my favorite books is Persepolis, which is a movie now. A lot of them are very personal, like Ghost World and American Splendor, which I love. And I love that in American Splendor, they kind of, they combined Harvey Picard. They had scenes where they had Harvey Picard actually in the movie. Did you actually read the script? No, a little bit. I, and I just, just to check the could construction. We looked through the comics and what was kind of fascinating is that even though he's being drawn by drastically different artists with different styles, it's still like the same guy. Like it's still, you would never for a second think it's not Harvey P. Carr. So we thought, how can we represent that in cinema? Would you do that? The movie. Is this all a working stiff like you can expect? You gonna suffer in silence for the rest of your life, or are you gonna make a mark, huh? So we had all these different representations of Harvey P. Carr in the same movie, you know, and in that way we stayed true to the comic book. Comics are so far out of the ghetto that they were in, it really has become the mainstream in a lot of ways. Back in the 70s, though, that was hardly the case. Hollywood was evolving. A new generation of young directors was changing the look and feel of American cinema. In this new Hollywood, there was little room for kid stuff like comic books. That's when it turned. That's when it 60s slid into the 70s and it got real depressing. And I think people didn't appreciate the artistry and people didn't appreciate the, the kind of the primal storytelling, the essential humanity of so much of what comic books are about. But comics were evolving in their own right, finding new life in ever more complex storylines and a more sophisticated audience. We took comic books and we said, hey, guess what? It's a valid medium and we're going to talk about everything. Spider-Man by Stan Lee at Marvel was the first comic book to address the use of drugs and the bad effects that drugs can have on you. And in order to publish the comic books, Stan had to circumvent the Comics Code Authority. So you had writers that, that were actually 
you know, reporters or uh, editors who were former reporters and, or, or authors. And uh, they saw these characters and they realized, well, wait a minute, why do, why do these characters have to be uh, frivolous? We did a cover where Speedy was <laughs> obviously a junkie and, and Green Arrow, who is his guardian, uh, is kind of looking at him and, and uh, Green Lantern goes, huh, see, huh, see, what do you think of that? Jerk. And that changed comics. In those days, people were not ready for comic books to say anything. So when we did, it was like, whoa, whoa, what's that? At a time when movies and comics were turning towards serious material, an earnest, gravity-defying hero changed Hollywood history. This groundbreaking film reached back to a tried-and-true comic book classic. In 1978, which is interesting because it's like in a very cynical moment in our history, this this Man of Steel, this, this Superman movie, which is this all-American icon, really captured the um, imagination. In the hopes of updating this well-traveled title, producers Alexander and Ilya Salkind spared no expense, hiring big-name writers, including the team behind Bonnie and Clyde and Oscar winner Mario Puzo. They follow him as a, a name because of The Godfather. And he sent in the script, and it was god-awful. It was a story kill the Pope. And that's, that's not a Superman story. It had a crazy history. For a time, it was going to be a campy version. There was talk of going way over the top. I kind of did it in defense of Superman. It, the only reason I really think I got involved is I said, what if they make this? What if they, somebody steps on board and makes this picture? They're going to destroy a lifetime, a history of Superman. I was brought up on Superman. And you didn't make fool of mm -hmm. Superman. Donner's biggest battle with the studio was to find the perfect actor to play the title role. They wanted to get a big star, big name star for the film. They went with Clint Eastwood, uh, uh, who else? I heard Stallone was up for it or something, too. Yo, Lois. I once heard a story that uh, Ilya Salkind was considering Muhammad Ali for Superman. <laughs> they wanted more names. I mean, they were going out to Redford and Jimmy Kahn and Paul Newman. And when I came on board, I said, hold it. I said, I got to make it believable that a man's going to fly. So, I mean, that's going to take me. I don't know how to do that yet. And you sure don't want to see a famous actor flying because you're going to see it's the actor flying, not Superman. So against a lot of their wishes, but we had the strength at that point, we went out looking for a new face. Donner did cast some well-known stars in supporting roles. But in Donner held an open casting call in New York. This kid walked into the office, and he had on this burly sweater, great big sweater, and he had a great chiseled face. He looked interesting, and uh, he was so sincere. I was wearing horn-rimmed glasses. I put my horn-rimmed glasses on him. And he was Clark Kent. When Christopher Reeve came on board and no one had seen him before, it wasn't, oh, Christopher Reeve is playing Superman. You go, oh, no, that's Superman. Grew up, you know, loving Christopher Reeve. I had a huge crush on him, and I really believed Superman was real, and I wanted to be Lois Lane. There's a real a poignancy to seeing the film now, because we all know that, you know, what, what happened with him after his accident. And then the work he went on to do, you know, I mean, you have to really admire the man. So in a lot of ways, he really should be eulogized because he is a great example, you know, just on a human level, you know, the triumph over adversity, a real Superman. The first uh, Superman for me remains one of the supreme comic book to film adaptations of all times. That's probably the best film made from a comic book. That first Superman movie was was finally a comic book being taken seriously. Released in December of 1978, Superman was the first comic book movie to open at number one at the box office. And as its grosses soared toward $300 million, producers tried to cash in on three sequels during the 80s. Superman's place in Hollywood history was now secure. Richard Donner's Superman, 1978 Superman, uh, is still, you know, kind of the, the benchmark for comic book movies. And even today, directors and filmmakers refer to that movie as being a standard to try and meet. Almost three decades later, director Brian Singer continued the Superman saga. Singer's version owed as much to Richard Donner as to DC Comics. From the vision of crystals from Krypton to the casting of a handsome unknown, 
to the spectral image of Marlon Brando as Jor-El. Superman Returns is faithful to the popular 1978 film, rather than an expensive studio remake from the bottom up. I hope this experience hasn't put any of you off flying. Statistically speaking, it's still the safest way to travel. And it was sort of the bravery of Warner Brothers to put aside all their other versions and all their other uh, incarnations and let me uh, take a crack at it. Singer is part of a modern Hollywood generation that grew up believing in the art and power of comic books on the page and on the screen. Now we're talking about real comics fans who became filmmakers, they became directors and writers and producers. They might work behind the scenes. So they were really playing with material that they grew up with, that they had a love for, that they had a nostalgic pang for, and that they understood. Sam Raimi was a huge Spider-Man fan as a child. It's Spider-Man drawn on the wall behind his bed. When the geeks take over the making of those movies, when people that care about the material start uh, taking charge of those franchises, they create an independent movement. Channeling his inner geek on the set of Hellboy 2, Oscar-nominated filmmaker Guillermo del Toro has directed three comic book movies. When you have directors like del Toro and Sam Raimi, you have guys who are still, they still have that little kid thing, and they still think comics are cool. Well, as a filmmaker, it's really fantastic to work from a graphic novel or a comic book because it's such a visual medium. The images are there, um, and they're often fantastic images. Comic books are basically storyboards, highly, highly detailed storyboards. And because the frames have to tell the story, we need to get characters, we need blocking, we need basically the same process as making a movie. That's what we do as artists. We direct actors, we direct scenes, we direct action and drama and dynamics. The difference is, movies move. Before a who's who of Hollywood A-listers would sign on to create blockbuster superhero franchises, the comic book movie genre was in jeopardy in the late 1980s. Its demise hastened by a slumping Man of Steel. Kryptonite never killed Superman, but uh, Richard Pryor sure did. And Superman 3 and Superman 4 bombed. I don't think they wanted to take any chances on comic book films. The 80s was kind of a, a dry period. Hollywood just wasn't interested in making any comic book movies. I think because of the failure of Superman as a brand, they felt, well, if a, the biggest character of them all, Superman, isn't going to succeed at the box office, what chance does any other character have? To the rescue would come another hero out of yesteryear. Batman was a chance to start it all over again. Batman has always been cooler than Superman, I think, in, in a lot of people's opinions. It's dark, it's spooky, it's weird, he's got much better villains. Still, Batman's journey to the big screen was difficult. I was rejected by every studio in Hollywood. Turned down by everybody. Not only turned down, I was told I was crazy. I was told it was the worst idea they ever heard. Michael, you're out of your mind. You, you can't make a movie based on an old TV series. Producer Michael Uslan, a former DC Comics editor, wasn't interested in resurrecting the campy series from the 60s. Instead of Adam West's kitsch, he envisioned something closer to the complex character in a revolutionary new Batman comic, The Dark Knight Returns, by a hot young writer and artist named Frank Miller. Frank Miller was one of the real genuine geniuses in our field. Other people had been doing Batman as this grim, dark character, but Frank got so much attention because he went so much further with it. It incorporated a lot of film noir, kind of shadowy, atmospheric artwork. And I remember even some of the comic book panels, there was a sequence where Batman's parents are killed and it looked like slow motion. Batman had this sort of like, you know, paramilitary gear and he looked more like a soldier or some sort of science fiction character. He looked a lot more menacing and scary, which is, you know, like, this is something Frank's always saying that's the essence of the character is striking fear. It just felt like when Frank took hold of it, he gave it some real balls. It got a lot of attention, and I think that showed Hollywood that this is, you know, what Batman could be. Almost 20 years later, Miller would become a star in his own right. His graphic novels, Sin City and 300, were among the hottest properties in Hollywood. 
but his artistic impact on movies began with Batman. It helped convince people that there was a growing sophistication in the comic book world. The director entrusted with reimagining The Dark Knight was Tim Burton, whose background in animation made him a prime candidate to adapt a comic book character to live action. But it was his unique filmmaking vision that earned him the job. The most important thing that happened that began to allow that 1989 Batman movie to coalesce was the hiring of Tim Burton. Mr. Burton was walking from department to department throughout the entire development of the project with The Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller in his hands saying, I want it to look like this. He wanted it dirty, gritty, he wanted it ugly, he wanted Gotham to scare you. We took the artistry of comic books seriously. I mean, Tim Burton is a film artist, so the look of the film was beautiful. It wasn't just about special effects, it was also about the design, it was about the uh, cinematography. He stylized the first Batman movie so that he kept the flavor of the comic book and yet he made it appealing to adults. Perhaps the strangest decision was the casting of Michael Keaton. Hiring Mr. Mom to play Batman drew considerable concern from the comic book's fans. But Burton, who had directed Keaton in Beetlejuice, got his man into the Batsuit. He said, but I know, with Michael Keaton, we can create a portrayal of Bruce Wayne, who is driven, who is obsessed to the point of being psychotic, where the audience would go, oh yeah, that guy would get dressed up as a bat and go out and do this. He was absolutely right. I brought a hat to the premiere so I could eat it in front of him. I loved that they allowed Batman to be a bit dark and brooding and kind of crazy. And that made it kind of real for me, that it's like, yeah, this guy, you know, he's really, he had this horrible trauma and he's, he's pissed off and he's gone kind of nuts. The movie's linchpin performance was Jack Nicholson's turn as the Joker. As Brando had done for Superman, Nicholson gave the studio a marketable Hollywood heavyweight. Jack Nicholson from the beginning was the only actor I thought who could play the Joker. And the day he was signed was one of the great days of my life. Jack Nicholson playing the Joker was a very big deal. And so, you know, there was a, it lend a lot of respectability to the comic book, uh, into film genre. The magic of Burton and Jack Nicholson teaming up with Frank's darker version of things. That was different because it was dark. It was a big budget. I don't know why Hollywood decided to do it. It was a little jarring for fans when that film came out, especially people that came from it from the 60s TV show. But the comic book purists, the people that understood that character, you know, really saw what was actually in the books, which was you know, very unique at the time because it had never really been done you know, to that extent. The movie opened with unprecedented success. It was the first movie to bring in $100 million in its first 10 days and went on to become the top grossing film of 1989. It generated revenue and excitement worldwide. This one has Tim Burton's handprints all over it, and I'm, and I'm really glad that it does, because it's great. That summer, when the Berlin Wall fell, I'm watching CNN, and at like 1.30 in the morning, I can't take my eyes off it. Coming through the wall into freedom is a kid wearing a Batman t-shirt. It had the largest opening weekend of any movie in Hollywood history. And Hollywood went, oh my God, we've got, you know, superhero movies. That's the next big thing. Of course, then came the sequels. Three more movies would follow, with Burton and Keaton dropping out after the second film, Batman Returns. Director Joel Schumacher took over, along with a rotation of high-profile Batmans and superstar supervillains. Nothing could be more Hollywood than those Batman movies, so... We got to see bigger sets, we got to see bigger stars. They tried to lighten it up um, with Batman Forever, which was a box office hit. It made more money than Batman Returns. It just did really well. <laughs> it sold a lot of tickets and people came to see it. Um, and it sold a lot of toys and did really well with Happy Meals for a while. And, you know, it sold a lot of licensed merchandise. What's not a good thing is if a studio becomes more interested in toys and Happy Meals than in character and story. Then you have the collapse of every comic book movie uh, in development at that time, which was Batman and Robin. Batman and Robin was a huge investment for the studio, and they put every weapon they had at their disposal, including Arnold Schwarzenegger. It could have gone this way, it could have gone this way. Unfortunately, it went this way. 
And I don't think I don't think it happened in, in, because people consciously did it. I think it just happened because of the system. The system just rolled it out that way. A decade after the gaudy fourth film, Batman would make a comeback. Batman Begins was a huge success because it returned to the dark side. This was not simply a movie, Batman Begins, that could be described as a great comic book film, but it was a movie that could be described as a great film. And from the opening frames, the audience didn't feel they were in watching a comic book movie. They might have been watching Lost Horizon, for all they knew. It felt real. Actor Christian Bale and director Christopher Nolan went deeper into a comic character's soul than any adaptation ever has. I think that Nolan had a really, really acute take on the character because we could hardly see him. And the scenes he appeared in, they were very dark. And we could see an arm or a part of an eye, a helmet or a little silhouette. Where are you? Here. <laughs> he kept his Batman very mysterious. And that's the way that character should really be. People think a comic book movie should be bright colors and splashy and fun like a Superman movie or like the Batman movies. Everyone says they're dark, but you go back and watch them again, the, the first Batman movies, you know, there's a silliness to them. I think it's in the same way that you take a large franchise like uh, James Bond. It's another successful, great one, I think. The la that latest film is great. It's probably necessary at this point, considering how, how technology is developing at such a rapid pace, to update Batman every 10 years. I was really surprised by Batman Begins. I really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to the next one. With trend-setting properties like Batman and Superman, DC Comics was for decades the champion of comic book adaptations. The publisher and its parent company, Warner Brothers, earned huge financial rewards at the box office without much competition. In the 80s, rival Marvel Comics mounted a challenge. For years, even after uh, Superman and the Tim Burton Batman film, Marvel had uh, just a devil of a time uh, ever getting any of their characters uh, onto the screen. Through the 80s, there was Howard the Duck that Lucas produced that was a total bomb. Early to mid-90s, still seemed like they were trying to kind of find their footing. If there was a driving force behind Marvel's mission, it was Stan Lee. As an editor since the 40s, Lee had presided over the so-called Marvel Revolution and built the company into a publishing powerhouse. Stan Lee is kind of the Walt Disney of that generation. His personality has a lot to do with his success. It's something that when you're reading comic books as a kid, you don't think so much. I mean, he was just like a little cartoon figure on the letters page, and you don't realize that so much of what made Marvel what it was must have been Stan's personality and his relentless energy and enthusiasm. But Marvel struggled to connect with a wider audience beyond comic book readers. The company had broken into animation, but its live-action crossover success was limited to a 1977 Hulk television show starring Bill Bixby and former bodybuilding champion Lou Ferrigno. DC had Superman and Batman, as well as popular TV versions of some other old-time classics, Captain Marvel and Wonder Woman. While DC was having all the success, everybody wondered, what the hell is Marvel doing? Because they, they had a couple really horrible TV shows uh, or TV movies. There was the Spider-Man TV show, a couple of guest appearances by Thor, and there was um, there was a Doctor Strange made-for-TV film. They had a, a god-awful Captain America thing where he wore a motorcycle helmet, and just it was so embarrassing because, again, as a guy who grew up reading Marvel Comics, you knew they had all the really cool characters. Problem was, filmmaking technology was not advanced enough to make the Marvel Universe work on the screen. You were dealing with powers that Technologically, Hollywood was not ready to go for in a good way. Marvel was the more naturalistic, the more science fiction based. You know what I mean? More of the characters who had something wrong with their blood or something wrong with their minds that turned them into what they are. These are very different characters than DC Comics. DC Comics are all heroes, they're all great guys. These guys are side characters, they're monsters, they're damaged goods. The DC superheroes are, are more idealized. The Marvel superheroes are more, you know, existentialist, outsider, teenager, angst-ridden, and those were harder to bring to the screen. In time, the publisher would become the most prolific and recognizable player in comic book blockbusters. But when it initially tried to break DC's stranglehold on superhero cinema, Marvel took some serious lumps. 
Marvel had a kind of take the money and uh, do whatever you will uh, with our products. Its first licensing gamble resulted in a low-budget movie version of Captain America. I had no idea what I was in for. We shot in Dubrovnik and all around Yugoslavia, around the Adriatic. In the middle of the summer, it was one of the hottest summers of the decade, too. And I had this body suit, this muscle suit of foam rubber with latex on top of that. And I lost 25 pounds during filming of the movie. <laughs> Just pure sweat. It was brutal. It was brutal. Captain America choked at the box office, but Stan Lee kept at it, striking a deal to shop Marvel titles as an independent producer. In the imprint's next adventure, a German company optioned the movie rights to Marvel's beloved superhero team, the Fantastic Four. To comic book fans, it was on the radar. It was like, when is it getting released? Um, it's, you know, it's the Fantastic Four. It's the first big Marvel movie. Or not. More than a decade before the Fantastic Four would star in a pair of high-tech, $100 million blockbusters, veteran independent filmmaker Roger Corman was called in to oversee an enigmatic first Fantastic Four movie. The story of how I came to produce the film is one of the strangest in my 50-some years of making films. A German producer, Bert Eichinger, who is a friend of mine, came to me with the script and explained to me his problem. He wanted to make it on a 30 to 35 million dollar budget, but he didn't have all the money, and his option would expire on December 31st, so he had to start shooting before December 31st. The option was going to cost them more money uh, than it was to produce the actual film and therefore lock up the rights in perpetuity. Well, I said, well, 30 to 35 million, how much do you want to cut the budget? He said, I want to cut the budget to $1 million. So the company, not wanting to lose the right to do Fantastic Four, gave Corman a million dollars and said, make a Fantastic Four movie. We don't care what it looks like, just do it. Shot on that shoestring budget in less than a month with distinctly low budget special effects, it was anything but fantastic. It all came together very quickly, but this was a, an opportunity to sort of be a part of Americana. I felt bad about it because the people doing the movie didn't really realize that it wasn't intended to be the quintessential Fantastic Four movie. A company whose name is similar to Marvel paid for that movie not to be distributed. Our Fantastic Four is languishing somewhere in a vault at 20th Century Fox. I've been told that DVDs of our Fantastic Four are available at comic book shows. I have no real comment because they have to be bootleg illegal uh, DVDs. Somebody sent me a bootleg of it years ago. I believe it's probably the most wretched film ever made. It's funny bad, though. It's, it's kind of hard to, to be upset at it because it's so bad. But you know... I think that the movie is more joyously thought of now. I think the whole project is more accepted as a footnote pop culture than it would have been had it come out at a time and run its course. With the company struggling in the 90s, Marvel needed to find a hit. Stan Lee teamed up with a toy-making mogul named Avi Arad. Right. This guy knows more about our characters, and he was the first one to realize that they could he took control of the company's titles and established Marvel Studios, the first movie studio directly operated by a comic book company. Marvel was in bankruptcy. A couple of boards fighting, killing each other for three years. So we couldn't even use the brand properly. The first Marvel films, they were really low-budget movies, and they didn't do that well because they weren't able to get the kind of special effects that movies of that sort need. The first really good one that was based on a Marvel character was Blade, the vampire hunter. Blade was a great way to start this journey. It was an R-rated movie. The hero was African-American. He was a vampire. That was really so well done, and it made everybody realize, hey, there's really something we can do with our characters. Suddenly, the race was on in Hollywood. There was this mad rush to try and, you know, make comic book movies in the 90s, but a lot of them were misfires. Really, the, the technology 
hadn't been there. It was either A, impossible, or B, too expensive to produce it on the screen. You couldn't get the true experience except for in the comics. The advance of technology would take comic book movies to new heights. CGI, computer graphics, has raised the bar so high that if you look at the earlier films, which were accepted at the time, and people thought these are really good, you see how primitive it really was. For us to make a man fly, I told you, it took, it took a year be more my, before the front projection unit that we had designed and built and planned and, and, and cried day in and day out because nothing worked. And that's how we had to make a man fly. If you want to make a man fly today, you say fly. Fly! Everything we did in that was a physical stunt rather than a computer generated one because there were no there were, computers were as big as hotels and they were used to fly people to the moon but not to uh, make films. Ironically, the first comic book movie to benefit from the technological evolution was X-Men, a story of highly evolved humans with unique abilities. The powers of the filmmaker had finally caught up to those of his subject. Now you really see it. You see people flying, you see buildings being lifted and moved around, and, it, you know, Magneto standing in front of it. Stops it. Flips it over and you say, well, that's cool, you buy it. X-Men 2000, that kind of, I mean, that really, like, to me, knocked down the doors and, and opened up the floodgates. Two years later, the DNA of the comic book blockbuster was altered forever. The most powerful superhero in the movie business emerged, and it turned out to be an awkward kid from Queens who got bitten by a bug. He wasn't a Playboy millionaire. He wasn't some alien from another planet. He was this 15 to 16-year-old kid that couldn't get a date. Hey, MJ. I don't know if you realize this, but we've been neighbors since I was six. Anyone can relate to Peter Parker, what he's going through, uh, his sort of adolescent, uh, you know, explosion, um, as much as they can love the sort of cool, whiz-bang Spider-Man stuff. CGI really enhances any story where, you know, magic and superhero powers are involved. You know, it allows the viewer to see things that can't really happen. You don't actually need to track with Batman as he drops off of the side of a building in Gotham and gets into the Batmobile. But you need to swing with Spidey. You need to feel that. You need to know that everything you've seen in the comic book feels in the movie like you imagine it would. You feel that's as real as when he's, you know, talking to MJ. An average on all of these films, probably about um, a good solid year and a half to two years of um, effects work, which, which starts with shooting reference of a person climbing a fence, for example. We got a lot of really good ideas of how a human body has to move to, to climb up against gravity. He's doing things that somebody can't really do. But we're also trying to mix that with the reality that will hopefully sell it to the audience as a real person. So much of those movies' appeal has to do with the visuals. I mean, when you see Spider-Man swinging from building to building, they just couldn't have done it that way years ago. So the movies would have lacked something. Still, it's the filmmaker's responsibility not to get caught up in special effects at the expense of character and story. And it's very important, I think, that the character has heart and has emotion and it's genuine and not just, you know, him basically trading hands with a bad guy for 30 minutes. Spider-Man found that balance. Kirsten Dunst turned Peter Parker's dream girl into America's big screen sweetheart. Willem Dafoe's turn as the Green Goblin earned him a spot in the supervillain Hall of Fame. And more than anyone, Tobey Maguire bulked up his image. We were all surprised at Tobey Maguire when, he, when we did Spider-Man. It's one of those things where you go, Tobey Maguire, really, Spider-Man? He's kind of small, I don't, I don't know, he plays some odd parts. And then he became Spider-Man. It was like, oh, Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man, that's cool. And he did a fantastic job. He just, he sold it. With Spider-Man, Marvel found its box office hero. All three franchise films, in fact, are the highest grossing comic book movies of all time. Spider-Man alone is worth a billion dollars. That was a monster hit. That was just sensational. And then, there was no stopping us. As the Marvel Universe opened for business, other Hollywood producers, 
and other publishers looked for a piece of the action. One of the relative newcomers was Dark Horse Comics, an independent publisher from Oregon once known for serializing movies into comic book form. Dark Horse first hit the big screen in the 90s, scoring its first hit with The Mask, starring Jim Carrey. Time Cop actually knocked uh, The Mask out of first place in the box office, so we had the number one in two movies. And from then on, we were in the film business. But it wasn't until 2004 that the company came into its own. A certain blue-collar demon would pound out nearly $100 million in worldwide receipts. And in his wake, Dark Horse artists were producing and developing three or four adaptations a year. Certainly they, they didn't direct all their attentions to film, but it did make them realize and it made other creators realize that you had a better shot of getting your stuff into Hollywood. In 2005, another cult comic from Dark Horse's pages launched a new vision of the genre, a film that was perhaps the ultimate melding of the arts. Sin City was probably the most literal adaptation of a comic book to film. The original graphic novel had film noir inspirations. It was written by none other than Frank Miller. Sin City director Robert Rodriguez revered Miller's work. It's pure. It's there. You can take the comic book and hold it up to the screen and go, my goodness, that's exactly the same image. State-of-the-art green screen technology allowed the film to look like a virtual live-action comic book. A rich cast of A-list stars brought to life a world where hookers and hitmen ruled the night. It's sexual and raw, unapologetically violent, bloody, and highly stylized. It's like no comic book movie ever brought to the screen. It's an absolutely compelling movie. Uh, you may disagree with the things that I find politically wrong about the movie, but visually, and uh, creatively, it's an absolute uh, juggernaut. It demonstrated a level of graphic filmmaking, which I think we've seen in music video and we've seen in advertising, but we haven't really seen in long-form narrative that I can think of. So stylistically, you know, it worked. It was beautiful. It was an artistic achievement. And it maintained, like, the grittiness and darkness to his vision, which is what Frank Miller just never wanted to compromise on. Sin City is another revolution. A revolution also because Miller, the comic book artist, was given the opportunity to co-direct the film. It's great for comics as a medium and as an industry for that matter. It's great for Hollywood. You know, they get to have a great storyteller. What Robert did, and Robert and Frank did in that movie, together, is they really gave birth to a whole new world of possibilities. It's pushing the limits, it's pushing the envelope. And there are moments when it absolutely works, and those moments when it works, I think, are a hint of the future of uh, audiovisual storytelling. With the Sin City sequel in the works, Miller is also making his solo directing debut with a feature adaptation of Will Eisner's The Spirit. Where we're going is far beyond me and, and far beyond anybody in this room, I suggest. The, the technology and the, and the talent that's at work right now is increasing exponentially. It's all about storytelling. It's all about graphic arts. Frank Miller has the perfect eye for storytelling. It's a very natural progression because who'd be better at directing something than somebody who spends his working day directing a comic book? Every panel is a different scene. It's a different camera angle. In recent years, comic books have become the single biggest force in Hollywood. All of a sudden, these things start evolving really, really fast. They start greenlighting one after another. I think they're going back now and, and looking at every classic DC, Marvel, you know, co superhero. That's why Superman returned and Batman began anew, each grossing over $350 million and had sequels greenlit almost immediately. A little fight in you. I like that. Then you're gonna love me. The Incredible Hulk has also come storming back to the screen. The latest film is the title's second adaptation in five years. Hollywood needs big movies to take advantage of their big technology, and that's why they turn to comic books, because they provide that. Life is very simple. If it sells, make them. 
And as long as you invest in a movie, if you can then do a sequel, that's good use of your money. Studios have also adapted dozens of new titles, some from the stranger corners of the comic book universe, some from the annals of traditional superheroes, and others from original works that cross over into the realm of horror, thrillers, political satire, and more. There isn't a storyboard in a comic book that we can't bring to life. I think the question is, who in the world is going to invent the next great comic book property and bring that out to market? See that? $100 million movie right there in my hand. Imagine, imagine being able to do that. That's pretty amazing. When you think of where we came from, from the lurid children's entertainment, from the funny books that everyone looked down their nose on, uh, comic books have come a long way. And finally, they're getting their due. I, I mean, the future of comic book movies, it seems like it can only get bigger and, and bigger, and I'm sure there's creative genius children out there that are already, you know, hatching the next crazy power that we haven't even thought of. The next step should be that the Hollywood work directly with us to create properties together. To basically, okay, let's 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 go into partnership here. Let's create stuff. Let's uh, you know, let's, let's put a chimpanzee in a box and see what happens. You know, one of the important things we're going to be experiencing soon is going to be the cultural impact of manga and anime from Japan. Go to a Barnes and Noble or a Borders, uh, Virgin Mega Store after school, and you will see walls of manga. Japanese comic books. Kids sprawled out all over reading them. Well, I think the future of comic book movies is it's unlimited as long as people can keep coming up with fresh versions of these things that people love.